Welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House US to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode number 20, titled The Uncreated Mind. Okay, now you all know about the Four Noble Truths, right? Everybody knows the Four Noble Truths? By heart, you know them right away? But do you, you know something? How many of them are ultimate reality and how many of them are relative reality? Do you know that? No? Because you know, non- to understand non duality, you have to understand duality, right? And there are different kinds of dualities. And the Four Noble Truths, so you all know that, right? So can you recite them? Yeah. Oh, you didn't hold up your hands. You didn't nod. No, okay, I'm sorry. So that's, you know, the truth of suffering. It's a noble truth. It's a noble truth of suffering because it means that the ordinary people, it's not true that everything is suffering. Ordinary people think this is fine. They have a saying, they say that an ordinary person and the opposite of a, of a noble person is a self-centered person. Literally, a one who sees everything only from their own point of view. That's called, there's an Arvak Darshana, it's a Sanskrit term, Surtong in Tibetan, means someone who sees everything hither. So, that's the opposite of a noble person. You know, they're always only embracing their own point of view, the ordinary person. And that person, when they're, nobody else is bugging them, then they're not suffering. <laughs> and they say it's like a grain of sand. Experience is like a grain of sand. And the ordinary person, it's like a grain of sand on the palm of your hand. It doesn't really irritate you very much. Whereas a noble person, it's, it's like a, uh, it's a grain of sand in your eye. Yeah, so therefore it's true that the ordinary world is experienced very sensitively by a noble person and they see it as suffering. Meaning that, it, meaning that they sort of accept that nothing works very well. Plumbing always breaks. We, you know, we die, we get sick, we grow old. It never quite works. You know, it's like that. But the ordinary person did it. Oh, it's working now. Oh, it's great. And uh, so that's the first truth. But that... That is only true, that is a description of the symptom of unenlightenment. The poor Pope Benedict was very upset about Buddhists. And he wrote in his book, well, he wrote it in Pope Paul's book, John Paul Paul. But he wrote it because he was the Grand Inquisitor at that time. And he said, The Threshold of Hope, that book, he said, How could anybody deal with Buddhists? So, they're all so miserable. I think only suffering is true. They should be happy because people who live in the Vatican. <laughs> and he was unhappy about Buddhists. But he doesn't understand that Buddha only said it's suffering because it's possible for human beings to overcome it and to be happy. That, do, you, do, you, do you realize that? If you ever hear people purporting to teach Buddhism who say that, you've got to accept suffering. And you know, you, you might take a break. <laughs> because the whole point is you don't have to accept suffering. That's the whole point of Buddha's teaching. Is you don't have to accept it. It's a product of being unenlightened, meaning not knowing what you are and not knowing what the world is. If you don't know what you are, where you are, what the world, who me, you know, then you'll suffer. Well we know that. It's that it doesn't take a Buddha to know that, it's obvious. But, but nobody who says that, if they think that's the way it has to be. Dalai Lama once said, he actually made the gesture. He said, if, if Buddha thought there was no way, nothing else than suffering, to inform people about it would be like someone who's in the prison for life and you're going, nya, nya, <laughs> you'll never get out. <laughs> and that isn't nice. <laughs> Right? So that's so the point is we shouldn't overdo about the suffering. We we don't need another source of suffering since we we are piously miserable all the time. 
clear. We feel okay, but we're miserable. I mean, at a certain, to a certain degree. Then we feel sort of safe. We can't, we're not going to get more miserable later. We're sort of like, well, okay, it's all right. <laughs> when we're really, really happy, or unhappy, or nervous because we think that we're going to get punished. Something's going to happen. It's going to be terrible. We must be crazy. But anyway, second noble truth is the cause of that suffering, right? And, and that's why Buddhism is not primarily a religion. Because the discovery of causation is not a religious discovery. It's a philosophical slash scientific discovery, right? When, when Ashwajit, one of the Buddha's first five disciples from the five or six, told Chariputra what Buddha taught when Chariputra pressed, pressured him, he said he taught about whatever has a cause, what are the causes, and how to interfere with the causes. That's what the great secret taught. That's the famous verse of Ye Dharma Hitu Prabhavai. So those two truths, noble truths, are relative reality or superficial reality or actually illusory reality. So in a sense they're unreal reality. Remember I asked you which truths are which? So those two are unreal reality. But they're, they have some degree of reality, but they're unreal ultimately. Right? Then the third noble truth. What is it, Mary? Come on. Huh? There is a path. No, 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 the third is not. Okay. The third of my best students. <laughs> the third noble truth is nirvana. Nirvana. Which means to be blown away. Literally, to be blown out. Like you do when you come back from a YouTube art concert. You see how well it's held? Blown away. Unfortunately, temporarily. But it's, that's exactly what blown out. When blown out is the suffering is blown out. So that's the Buddha's discovery, is nirvana. That's why he was said, if you say, if you say unenlightened, if you don't know what's going on, if you remain ignorant, you will suffer. And you should realize you, there's no way out of that suffering other than changing your ignorance into wisdom, coming to an understanding of your reality, which means wisdom doesn't mean, you know, seeing some far off place in the sky where you can run away to. That's a wrong understanding of nirvana. Wisdom means knowing what is the reality right here and now. Okay, that's what wisdom means. And I'm not sure that wisdom really means that. You know, I know I was talking with Isa, our guru Isa, and, and she was, and we were talking about intuition, and you know, different cognitive words for super understanding. The word pradnya in Sanskrit, pradnya, nya is the same no word, you know, in English. Do you, do you, do you, did you ever really think about why when you know something you have to know it? <laughs> if you can't pronounce, you know it, right? when you know it, you know it. So nya, nya in Sanskrit is the same Indo-European root of to know. And that ordinary knowing is something that you do that means with somehow your glottis in the top of your mouth. You, know? you know it in the back of your nose. You know? Something you do with your nose. You know. And uh, because that, because, and that means it connects to language and that, it means ordinary knowing, what you think is knowing, is having a name for something and, and attaching the name to it, labeling it, and saying, oh, that's a window. I know, I know that. So that's why I think it's a, it's a, it's a root like that. Nya. It's like, it's a kind of control thing. You know? But wisdom is what we translated in these things as wisdom, is pra -nya. Pra means super. Something like intense. So pra -nya means super knowing. So it's a, it's a, there's still a nya in there, but it's going beyond itself. And transcendent knowing, paramita, liberating what it's called, transcendent knowing, and that's a knowing that goes beyond a control kind of knowing. It's a knowing where you become what you know. You know, you know it without by just kind of merging with the object. So it's a non-dual subject object merging. Shall we wait for you to come back? Oh, sorry. Oh, that's fine. Right. Okay. <laughs>
Paul. Sorry. Right. So, so, what? I can't. So, so the, so that's that's so that's 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 super 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 no. So that's the third noble truth. Then the fourth noble truth is what Mary said: the path to the third noble truth. So it's it's like a medical diagnosis. It's not a religious. Even truth, you don't need to use the word truth. Such that can be reality, it can be fact. For facts, things that are factual for a noble person, non-factual for an ordinary person. And, and uh, so like a doctor, you know, oh yeah, okay, there's suffering, there's a cause of it, the symptom has a cause, and we analyze and make a diagnosis, and then prognosis is good. Nirvana is waiting for you. You can achieve freedom from that suffering. And then there's a therapy, and that's an educational process. It involves educating yourself ethically, educating yourself psychologically, and educating yourself intellectually and scientifically, actually. And, what, and this, is, this is the great thing about Buddha's discovery. This is his good news, Buddha's good news, is that reality of those four truths, the only one that's really true is the third one, to answer my own original question. That is to say, reality is nirvana. The path is even a little unreality, but it's a good unreality that helps get rid of the bad unreality. So you can discover the real reality. Do you follow me? But they're, those are, they're, they're not totally unreal in the sense that they don't exist. That's like, you know, a movie, when you watch Avatar, the movie I would prefer to live in, <laughs> you, if I had a tail and I was eight feet tall, I would climb into trees. And had that tree, I could go merge with the tree. Awa tree. Did anybody, does anybody here know the why James Cameron called it Awa? How thoughtful are you? I want to test this a test. <laughs> Am I the only one? What does the Awa spell backwards? Oh. Oh. Was that an awesome movie or not? <laughs> Did anybody not see that movie? <gasps> <laughs> you're so lucky. Because you're going to really love it. I mean, there's a little shooting and bombing. It's just a, a typical boring American Pentagon sort of stuff. But... It's so beautiful. <laughs> only, the only unhappy thing is Sigourney. But never mind. <laughs> so, so we have to find out what that means. But anyway, so that's unreal. In other words, there is no moon and Jupiter or wherever they go and they find. Does anybody know the name of the element that the mining company was seeking there? Do you remember the name? Does anybody know it? You guys, what? What was it called? Unobtainium. I couldn't hear it. Yes! That's a man! All right! Unobtainium! Unobtainium is what American culture, I don't call it civilization, what American culture is seeking by drilling the Arctic, by whatever, you know, by electing Republicans, by, you know, by not impeaching the Supreme Court for criminal irrationality, <laughs> making corporations into persons. Yeah, break. They don't need a drink of water. They're not persons. Oh, never mind. I shouldn't be involved. <laughs> non-duality. We're in non-duality. <laughs> so, so Buddha thought, okay, nirvana, so, so that's his good news. His reality is nirvana. That means the only real thing is bliss. Freedom. So that means that that's what we all are. You're all bliss. You know, Joseph Campbell famously said to Bill Moyers, follow your bliss. Only to have a New Yorker cartoon 40 years later with a guy standing out in the suburb somewhere with a tin cup 
only get out to get a quarter with a sign on his chest saying, I followed my bliss. <laughs> but you don't have to follow your bliss because you are bliss. Go on. Even in New York. <laughs> We're made of this. Why do you think that the atom, the, the electrons, orbit around the nucleus, and the nucleus somehow hangs out and sticks together there, and then it all gets glumped and glued together into like a, some plasma, a hand, you know, like a limb, bones, veins, bloodstream, brains. Why does that all happen? Enjoying. What? Enjoying. <laughs> yeah, they enjoy it. The, the cells like each other, they connect. And the atoms are molecules. They're not just, you know, these like uh, weird materialists have like, they think it's all a pinball game. Some kind of big pinball game, then they freaked out when they couldn't tell if it was a particle or a wave. <laughs> it's a wave because the wave sounds too wishy washy, you know, you can't hold on to it. And these guys are like, you know, they, they have the emotional play. These supposed scientists at MIT. You know what that is? You know, did you ever read Bill Helm, right? With the emotional play? Okay. Well, the emotional play is a brilliant expression by Bill Helm, right? The, the great Freud's greatest student, uh, who was arrested by a lot of people subsequently because he took that subconscious into the body. You know? And he said that the cultures, the militarized cultures of the planet, is, he lived in the 20th century, but we still stuck there. Uh, everybody has this emotional plague, and what it is is a kind of their structure of their nervous system. So they can't feel their own inner bliss. And they're organized to be emotionally constricted, where they can't feel it, what he calls inner streamings. And, and when they met at someone else who was streaming, they felt threatened by that. And so they wanted to crucify them, or arrest them, or do something to them, you know. Or, you know, that's why men want to put women in sacks and hide them in the kitchen, because they're less emotionally, tend to have less of an emotional play. He didn't, he didn't add that. 20th century. He didn't come to California. <laughs> he escaped from Lenin and Hitler, and, 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 but he only landed, came as far as me. <laughs> he, he was a little chilly. <laughs> so, so, so because we because we have that problem, the Buddha, well, you know, that of, of having this emotional play, having this structure, where we deny our own bliss, and we're afraid of it. Actually, anybody who feels bliss feels fear for it. About it. You know, they feel oh, I'm going to melt. You know. <laughs> and so they quickly have a smoke or something. You know, they, they don't, if they feel internal bliss or something, streaming, they think something's wrong. They think Satan's coming. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> they do. They burn people at the stake in Europe for a long time, and in Massachusetts. So, because of that, Buddha let people think that that third noble truth was a different place, nirvana, that you could go to. And if you practice the path, you know, and you had a realistic worldview, motivation, and ethical action, and livelihood, and ethical speech, and uh, effort, and mindfulness, and, and meditation, samadhi, concentrated meditation, that you would go to that different place. And that you can call dualistic Buddhism. And so that's sort of encouraging the person who is afraid of bliss that they can go find it somewhere else if they be less unpleasant about their way they live. And they, rec they clarify their mind, they educate themselves, they analyze and see through all kind of negative structures that mental ideologies and things that keep them in prison. And then they get a motivation that they can find freedom. And then they behave nicely to others not to disturb them and to also let be, create a more calm vibration around themselves. And then they do mindfulness to become more free inside their own mind and observe their negative functions and isolate themselves from them and then concentrate on that sense of freedom. And then they're hoping to disappear into nirvana. And this we call dualistic Buddhism. 
I haven't forgotten the topic of <laughs> talk completely. That's dualistic Buddhism. And that Theravada is that, that Theravada nowadays is that, well, there is a kind of Theravada that isn't quite like that in the older days. Up until 1000 of the Common Era, almost all Theravada people were also Mahayana people. Theravada was the vow that they had in the monastic institution, which was the university, the low-budget university, you know, the tuition-free university, free lunch university. And, uh, and, uh, but the, but the, ideology, the vision was much more expansive. It was non-dual Mahayana, universal vehicle. Most of the people. But after 1000, when India was de- Buddhist India was destroyed by invasion, then Sri Lanka and Thailand and Burma and these places, they kicked out all their Mahayana and they succumbed to the emotional plague. And they decided these people who said this is all Nirvana are dangerous. And we'll get back to where this is misery. The king has an army. And we're going to stay up tight. But we're going to escape to Nirvana. Do you follow me? That's dualistic Buddhism. So non but non-duality, but that's illogical, of course. Too. It's irrational, it's unscientific. Why? If Nirvana was simply another place, it's nothing, it cannot be absolute or ultimate. It would have a boundary that you'd have to cross to get to it. That would mean it would be a relational state. You would leave this state and go to that state. So it would be then something constructed by causation. It would not be the uncaused, the uncreated, the primordial, the reality that has always been here, un, untrammeled and un, undamaged, right? Logically, it would not be. When Buddha attained enlightenment in the sutra where he talks about it uh, himself, Although there are sort of there are a little bit different versions, but in the Lalita Vistara Sutra, where the Buddha tells his own biography, which which is a marvelous, you know what it means, Lalita Vistara. They translate it funny ways, but it literally means the greatest show on earth. <laughs> Lalita Vistara. Lalita means a play, which can be also a playful play, but also like a drama play, and Vistara means magnificent or expansive. So the magnificent drama put us life. You know, it's because it's, it's, it's all life is a teaching, something like that. So what he said was, Sabshi Usal Tutra Dumache, Dudzi Tawa Chutsi Konye. I best read the translation, but because I don't remember the Sanskrit, but I could translate it back for you. But Sab Shi. Sab means deep or profound. She means peaceful. Shanti. Ursa means clear light. Although don't be misled by the translation clear light for Pradhasvara. Clear light, you think it's a light, a bright thing, but it isn't. Clear light is gray, but it's diamond gray. It's a, it's a kind of luminosity beyond dark and light, beyond black and white. It's there are, when you die, or even when you fall asleep at night, according to Buddhist inner scientists, but you don't notice it when you fall asleep usually, unless you've developed a much more micro-aware consciousness by meditating carefully, thoughtfully, not just blanking your mind, but thoughtfully meditating. When you fall asleep, you go through a luminescent moonlit sky space state, you go through a radiant sunlit sky space state, and you go through a dark lit, a brilliant black sky space state, which you think of as the final destination where you feel as if you go unconscious ordinarily. ordinarily. In fact, you welcome that unconsciousness because you're dead tired after a long day, right? Then nobody's afraid to pass out in that context on your pillow. Far from afraid. You're delighted. <laughs> Somebody called on the phone, oh, you woke me up. <laughs> right? So why am I so scared of dying? You know, but that, that's another story. <laughs> so, so actually, the materialists are so fanatic about their materialism 
that they want to not be scared of dying because they think that's the one time I'm going to go to sleep and nobody's going to wake me up. <laughs> they are hoping. They know all of their experience that, you know, the poor materialists creeping around and, and post-retirement and left MIT and he did it and cracked at him and made them right in the field and he doesn't know what the mind is and he doesn't even know he has a mind. <laughs> and he's sitting there and he wants to pass out permanently because he's sick and tired of his rotten body. If you can remember that he has one or she. And but he's nervous because every time he's passed out for 70, 80 years, he gets woken up again. It is so irritating. <laughs> the alarm goes off, the sun rises, the kids scream, cars honk. So they've had the experience of never being able to stay unconscious because we human beings are massively escapists. Why do you think there's so many heroin at it? Is that just because they're stupid? It's because people are sensitive about pain and suffering and they hope to escape. People commit suicide thinking, if they're materialists, thinking they're going to be, stay asleep. They do. They think, just scrape my teeth and then there'll be nothing. Because some demented scientist who's supposed to be a paragon of knowledge, assured them that science has discovered there is no future life. We now know that. <laughs> Why? Because we've discovered it. How, how did we discover it? Because we know that all those people who died, they went into nothing. They became nothing. Their mind was nothing. So with that means, think about it. You, you don't have to be a mega scientist to think about it. That means... They found nothing. <laughs> and they reported back. <laughs> and they got tenure and billion dollar grants to figure out the atoms. And they won even Nobel Prize for discovering nothing. <laughs> are you saying those people are saying? They don't know what they're saying. They're incoherent. They need a good course in philosophy. <laughs> Any kind of philosophy. It doesn't have to be Buddha. <laughs> Just logical thinking. Who ever, you know, they go, oh, you future life people, you are so backward and old fashioned. Oh, there's all that superstitious stuff. What do you think? The earth is flat? And, and, okay, it's up to you to prove it. What's your proof? What's your evidence? They say it like that. And then you go, oh, uh, oh so you, you want to go get a hypnosis regression and remember your own previous life? Oh, I don't believe in that. I don't need a hypnosis. I'm not going over there. They say, they'll say, well, how about that kid who remembered their previous life? Oh, they just wanted to get on Johnny Carson's show. <laughs> oh, they, they, uh, they go like that. But then what, we never, we're so intimidated by them, we never ask them, oh, Excuse me, what is your evidence that there is no future life? Excuse me, what is it? Who was it who died uh, while still keeping their tenure and reported back at the faculty meeting, hey guys, I don't exist. Don't be afraid of the future life. It's just a priestly invention to terrorize you and get donations on Sunday. Whoever reported back that to you, what... What evidence do you have? And not only that, in, what evidence will you ever have that nothing is there waiting for you? Or that nothing is actually here and you're already nothing? Because <laughs> if you, that's what they're telling you, don't you realize that? They say you're just, just your brain, Ray Kurzweil. Oh, he's doing great. He's taking a lot of vitamins to wait till he can be a robot. Because he's just material. Dan did it. Yeah, I figured it out. It's replicators. They're just all replicators. There's a great sci-fi thing about replicators. It's all a bunch of replicators. Consciousness is replicators. So that means they're saying we are not here now. Any of us. These guys walk around. They go to their labs. They click their paycheck. They go home. 
and they talk that they're somebody, but actually they, none of them exist. They have no consciousness. They don't have a mind. They're in denial that they have a mind. And they insist that you don't either. Do you realize that? That is, the reason I'm, I'm sorry, I know I'm, ra- I'm, I'm a little bit rubbing this in, but this, this is to give you more self-confidence, actually, believe it or not. Because we are brainwashed that there are some authorities who tell us what's real, who are clearly psychotic. <laughs> they are living in unreality, they are directing our society, they are giving orders, we pay taxes, they can blow us up any time. They're polluting our planet, they're destroying other people, they're imprisoning millions of people, and we follow them. Because we think that they, may must, they must know. They have more information than I do. And we have no self-confidence to resist them. Actually, they're nuts. That is a fact. You feel, you hear, you exist. That's correct. You are, we're all here. We all have minds. That mind is not just the brain. The brain doesn't actually do that good job for the mind. Not only when later when we get Alzheimer's, we're eating too much ice cream, but <laughs> and drinking that rotten dairy that's all filled with hormones and weird crap that they sell to us that they should be arrested for producing. And they, and they capture the regulatory agencies and they produce this poison that they feed us. Then they say, oh, but give us research and we'll cure you. Uh, you get, oh, you have cancer. And, oh, but we've been feeding you this deadly poison. 80,000 poisons that we haven't said. I just read on the internet today. They're making a bill, chemical regulatory bill, of the 80,000 unexamined tech chemicals that are circulating around in our bodies already now. They're going to investigate five a year. <laughs> You're going to hold your breath? <laughs> hey, how about that? So these people, all of them should be impeached. You cheerful people, they should be impeached. But you know, it's not, but not violently, but mentally, you should, we should all see through this. And, and when you see through this nonsense, and next time you're in the dentist's office, and they tell you, oh yeah, I'm putting zirconium in there. I'm not putting uh, other weird stuff. And then you, this thing is in there that goes like zing, and all your nerves go like ah. And you don't believe them. I'm, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> okay, so, so, so here's the thing. So, Buddha's news is this reality is divine. He said profound, deep, peaceful, and luminous. And this luminosity is this infinite bed of energy of what is beneath what seems to be nothingness, which is infinite, abundant, clear light energy. The diamond, Vajra energy, the diamond energy that Buddha discovered, the bliss energy. And that energy is only knowable by being it. We have a concept for it, and the concept is imperfect, a clear light. In a way, it isn't light. Because everything is made of it, so no one thing is shining on another thing. You know, light has to project a shadow, right? Light has the opposite of dark, you know, yin and yang, yang and yin. But clear light is both yin and yang. It's beyond the duality of yin and yang, and that's what everything is made of. It's an infinite, abundant thing. So if, when you completely pass out, when you completely let go, with total faith and trust, then you, you are that. You, you feel you are that. And you're all right. That's why some of the times those people, when they, you with them when they die, and after all the struggling, then they sm- smile. Uh, they feel at peace. But it isn't, but that's just a, tr- a trace on the m- machine that they were inhabiting, the biological machine, that the soul was inhabiting, the soul embodiment, the subtle mind, the subtle persona, the subtle continuum. And it just leaves that mark on the, on the body that's left. Because they're no longer that body. They're no longer constrained by that body. You know, you've all read near-death experiences. I know you have in this group. you read the NDE literature, the near-death experience literature. Some of you might have read Eben Alexander, 
the arch traitor neuroscientist <laughs> who insists that the mind can exist beyond the brain and he can prove it, and they hate him. He's like they burn him at the stake, along with me, in the in the central quad of MIT, where to be burned at the stake, you all invite it. <laughs> no, because they are a big orthodoxy, they control all the resources. Because people think they know something. They convince them that they do. They have a brotherhood, a guilt. And they are just as primitive as any Inquisition ever was. They go around, nobody could have tenure if they think. This started in the 1830s in Germany, von Helmholtz. Anybody who followed Goethe and said it was a vital principle that science had to pursue couldn't get tenure in a German university since 1837. They had to take the anti-vitalist oath. You don't know that, but that's a fact. And it's the same here today. Psychop, it's called. They will go and haunt you at your tenure review if you're a scientist in case they figure you log too many hours at a Dharma center <laughs> and meditate. You might be going soft ahead of time. They don't mind if the old guys up to the Nobel Prize go soft and talk about spirituality. That's kind of thing. I think that's cute. <laughs> but they're not getting any money anymore anyway. But the people with the money, they have to be materialists. It's an inquisition. It is. Totally. Non-duality, I'm trying to give you this self-confidence because non-duality is a very powerful idea. And it's something that you can get at as an idea, and you can open your mind toward it, and it will give you tremendous, be like a balm to your mind. They say that emptiness, voidness, is a, which is like clear light, same thing, clear light and void. Emptiness is like a balm, you know, like tiger balm. You know? It's like a balm to the pains of the mind. But then you shouldn't make a, you shouldn't confuse it with nothingness. Because it's this everythingness, this clear light, infinite energy. Of the infinite interconnectedness of all things. Relativity, actually. And it's a scientific discovery. It's a physics discovery. And your own mind is, can be a physicist then. And you stop being frightened of these people who frighten you because, by making you think that all you are is your physical body. And they're in control of the circumstances surrounding and inside your physical body. And they're trying to convince you they're in control of even your sense of consciousness. It's just some chemicals in your brain, which they are going to sell you the better ones. <laughs> if you have more confidence, you will decide, I will fix my brain with my mind. Because my brain is the tool of my mind. And I have a mind. And I'm not going to listen to people who tell me that, neither, that, that they don't have a mind. If they don't have a mind, they're nuts, and I'm not going to listen to them. <laughs> All right? So, so this is the, brings us to the non-duality that means, oh, he said, yeah, clear light, then he said, Jojo, non-proliferating, and Dumache is the most important, uncreated, so that means that reality is uncreated. God didn't create it. You know, Aristotle didn't create it. An uncaused cause didn't create it. Created things are destroyed later. You know, they're made of causes and then they destroy it. So that's all part of relative illusory process. Not totally unreal, but only relatively real. Not really absolutely real, because they all rise and fall. They're impermanent. They're hollow, they dissolve under analysis. But the uncreated is reality that is always there. It's always been there. So this is the news of the night. You're already in nirvana. Right now. And you've always been in nirvana. And you never left nirvana. And you actually can't leave nirvana. But you can carry on failing to enjoy nirvana for a really long time. <laughs>